Okay. All right. So here we are. Uh, so this talks about the syllabus a little bit. And um, like I said, we will get started out. The ha, our, have, oh, we still haven't seen it. Yeah, there you go. Let's see. Oh, maybe a, let me make sure I shared the right screen. Nope. Wrong screen. Let me flip it over. All right. Try again here. There we go. Okay. Um, can everybody see the slide? Okay. Yep. Yes. Good. Okay. So again, uh, so I I talked about a little bit about this. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through this pretty quickly because I did cover this on Wednesday. So the syllabus, uh, the course is divided into three parts. Uh, this first part where we're going to talk about switching algebra, binary numbers, and number systems, and just basic concepts of analog, digital, and some of the some of the uh, tools of digital that have allowed it, us to to do to achieve the level of complexity that that many digital devices have achieved. Um, the first part. The second part is combinational design, and the third part is sequential design. Now, sequential design will use uh, lots of combinational design parts. So, and of course, combinational design is going to use uh, uh, Boolean algebra and binary numbers extensively, as well as hex. Uh, okay, so we talked about these things. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot down a little bit. You know, we talked about grandma and the email. This is really what's going on. This is, you know, this is what grandma sees, just the just the Outlook or whatever program she's using. Actually, Outlook's pretty complicated, but um, and uh, we talked about degrees of freedom and complexity. We talked about the principles of hierarchy, modularity, and regularity that help us to uh, we apply that to digital design to make digital design more feasible. Um, And then, um, so digital is a subset of the analog world. It's just an area where we only let signals have two different values, uh, basically true and false. Now, <clears throat> we, can, we can combine a number of, of, of bits, each of which can only have two values to get much larger numbers of values. But in the digital world, everything is, is quantized. We, it's put into a bucket. Uh, and that bucket is represented by some number of bits. And so given the number of bits, it, say if you have n bits, then you have two to the n buckets. Uh, we deal, everything is forced into multiples uh, or powers of two, basically. So we, we, don't have, uh, we don't have 500 things, we always have 512 things. We don't have 1,000 things, we have 1,024 things. And we don't have 2,000 things, we have 2,048 things, and so forth. So when we say 1K, we're really not talking about 1,000, we're really talking about 1,024, because that's the power of two that's closest. And I, I'm, in a minute, I'll go through uh, how you can do powers of two in your head uh, all the way up to you know, exabyte levels, uh, petabyte levels, even. All right. So. Exa examples of digital things. So you can have a glass thermometer or you can have a digital thermometer. You can have a, uh, your speedometer can be a needle that moves across the, the meter in your, on your dashboard, or you can have one that actually uh, reads in, in digits. Um, but, we, but in the digital world, signals are all quantized. A good analogy to this is to think about music. Uh, if you look at a, a typical, um, uh, score or, or you know some music what you'll see is that uh that for the most part uh all the notes are either whole notes half notes quarter notes eighth notes 16th notes uh 32nd notes uh and usually that's it not too many 64 notes although there are clearly are some and there are even crazier notes than that but for the most part scores are restricted to those notes. That's it. You can't have a one uh, uh, 31 note, or you can't have a one uh, 17th note. Uh, they basically don't exist. So the notes are forced into these arbitrary uh, bins, 
whole bends with whole notes, bends with half notes, bends with quarter notes, and so forth. And that's very much the way digital works. We we take a signal and we quantize it. Now, it, in the analog world, the signal can vary continuously over some range. In the digital world, we also have a range, and the signal can vary over that range, but not continuously. It has to jump from one bin to the next bin to the next bin. It always has to be in one of the bins. Uh, now, you would think that that would mean that analog was more accurate, but that is absolutely not the case. And the reason that's not the case is because we can increase the number of bins in the digital world to a number that exceeds what's physically attainable, what's physically realizable. And, and so if we exceed what's physically realizable, then our, our, then uh, the analog world, you can, you can say you can read your thermometer to uh, you know, a millionth of a degree, but in fact, you can't. In, in fact, a great example of this is uh, when the news media uh, announces with great glee uh, that you know, this was the coldest uh, or warmest uh, you know, uh, year on record, and they, they say it was warmer by, uh, you know, by point, uh, one hundredth of a degree. But what they fail to mention is that the temperature sensors they're using to achieve that number are not that accurate. They don't read to a hundredth of a degree. Uh, so it's actually a lie. Uh, it's sort of a, you know, it's sort of a sharp pencil drawing lines kind of lie. Uh, and the other thing is we don't actually measure the temperature uniformly across the entire globe uh, with some you know, space-borne sensors. In fact, the space-borne sensors don't agree with those statements. They read, they read differently. Uh, the the Earth-borne sensors uh, may show that, but only because they're weighted towards population centers, and we know that cities are a little hotter than non-cities. And so it's it's just all sampling error and 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 misstatement of scientific fact because our, our measurement devices aren't that accurate. So they just kind of play games with the numbers. And and uh, and this is of course done. Uh, well, I won't speculate on the motives, but but it's not done for science. All right. So, so in the analog world, uh, we we have hard limits on precision. Uh, so let's see if I think. Uh, well, we have hard limits on precision in the digital world. We don't. Now, that seems counterintuitive because the signal in the analog world can vary continuously over the defined range, right? So in theory. It can vary from one volt to 1.0001 volt to 1.002 volts and so forth. And yes, theoretically it can. The problem is you can't measure that with any analog sensor you can produce. Um, you can't measure that with digital sensors either. But what happens when you, when you have a measurement in the analog world, it's usually represented as a voltage level or a current level or something. And, and it's, and, and what you have trouble doing is preserving that value in your system because your system's analog. So that value lives as a voltage. And since there's always noise in the millivolt range on most things, that, that signal, even no matter how you try and preserve it in your analog device, it's going to be wiggling around a little bit to the tune of maybe millivolts for sure, microvolts. And so as a result, that number is going to vary. And, uh, and, and you really can't preserve it in an analog system because of noise. Whereas in a digital system, you're basically almost immune from noise. Now, noise can affect the digital system, but you can redesign your digital system and you can make it redundant, you can make it fault tolerant, and you can actually make it so that, uh, so that noise is not gonna screw your signal up. And then you can assign as many bits as you want to hold it so you can achieve whatever level of precision you want. So it's, uh, so it's pretty amazing. So let's see if we can find, uh, well, I talked about the NVIDIA board. Uh, they're, 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 uh, um, they're two chips, each of which has seven, uh, seven billion transistors, which works out to be between the two chips, 14 billion transistors. Now, if you do, if you do the, the math and, and assign, even if you assign a half an inch, to each, uh, to, to the circuit for each transistor, which is, that's pretty small. It might not be big enough to actually draw it. 
the schematic would require many square miles to actually print out. The paper, the piece of paper would have to be the size of San Antonio. This is this is incomprehensible. This means that this NVIDIA board never there's never been a schematic generated for it, which is crazy, right? Now, part of the reason they the NVIDIA boards can get this big is because they they have lots lots of copies of similar circuits in them. But uh, so maybe they they have a pretty good block diagram and maybe even something approaching a schematic for one of their blocks. But but the scaling problem here is really enormous. And that's why that's why we have to use. Uh, well, first of all, it shows us how complex our digital systems can be. And secondly, it shows us that we have to use hardware description languages to make them because we can't use standard uh, the standard techniques we used to use back in the days when we had analog devices. Um, so let's see this this one got screwed up. This slide. I'll move this around just a little bit. No, crud. Oh, I see. It won't let me edit. Okay. Oh, it will. Okay. All right. So there's there's some terms I want you to understand, and and I want you to make sure you 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 really grasp these because these are really important for engineers to understand. Uh, normal people don't understand them, but engineers need to understand them because they're they we we do we deal in applied science, and if anything is integral to applying science, it's the concepts of precision and accuracy. All right, or validity if you want to throw that in. That's that's not in common usage but precision and accuracy are precision is the ability to to read a value of a signal say to a certain number of decimal places are are we call precision the number of decimal places so it's your ability to read a value to a certain precision to a certain number of decimal places accuracy is the degree to how close any particular reading comes to the actual value that you're trying to measure which you may or may not actually know, but uh, but in in at least at the theoretical level, there is some real value that that the signal actually is, and the degree to which you get close or 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 hit that actual value is a measure of your accuracy. So so actual or accuracy, that's the actual value, and then if if your reading is both very precise and and very accurate then we would call it valid, which means that it's true for both. All right. So in this case, so here, here's, a, here's an analog pressure gauge. Here's a digital pressure gauge. So if you look at this gauge, this, this, the scales aren't the same, so I apologize. I probably need to get better pictures. But if you look at this varying from 0 to 100, Somebody tell me how, ac how how accurately can you how precisely can you read this? Can you read this to uh, can you read this to uh, one um, psi pound per square inch? Can you read it to point one? Go you ahead. Probably read it to about point one. Well, if you think about it, remember. So here are the marks. So this is ten. So this mark here is two. So you have to be right in the middle to hit one. Can you see 10 different values between the first mark at zero and the and halfway in between the first two marks? I would argue probably you can't. So, so you probably can't read it to point one. You might be able to read it to point three or four, maybe. Point, maybe two, maybe point two if you're really eagle eye. How about over here? No problem. You can read that to, to, to one PSI, right? That's 250. You could read 249. You could read 251. Can you read this gauge to a tenth of a PSI? No, there's no digit for it. 
but you can, probably can't do that on this one. So maybe you could argue that you could read maybe this one slightly more precise, but, but here's what I would argue. When you read this one, every time you read it, every time you read this gauge as it now sits, you're gonna read exactly the same number. You're gonna read 250. That may not be accurate, but it's gonna be very precise. Whereas here, I might read this as, as, uh, as uh, 12 PSI, but I might read it as 11.9. I might read it as 12.1. Those are options. They're not options here. So, so every time I read this, I could get a slightly different reading. So the precision on this is clearly not as good as the precision on this. The accuracy, well, I, maybe I can read this slightly better than this because I the most I can do is get one PSI on this, plus or minus one PSI. And here, maybe I can get plus or minus a half a PSI anyway, maybe. So this might be more accurate. Or, well, it might be, in that sense, it might be more, uh, it, it might be more accurate. But because my reading is going to differ every time I read it by more than this, it's not probably as precise. So another way of looking at these, it, this target illustration kind of shows you. So. If here you have a tight shot grouping, but it's not on the bull. Here you have a grouping that's spaced around the bull, but it's not very tight. Here you have one that's all over the map. It's not very tight and it's not centered on the on the center of the target. So in this case over here, the first one, this is precise, but not accurate. This is accurate, but not precise. This is neither accurate nor precise. And this is accurate and precise. Does that make sense? Yes. So those are concepts I really like you to think about. And now there are cases where they, they get a little confused, I guess. But for the most part, these apply to everything we do. You have to ask yourself, you know, when I, when I get a reading, am I reading, if the, say the value of the signal I'm, I'm trying to read doesn't change, do I get the exact same value, exact same reading every time I read it? Or does it vary a little bit? And how much does it vary? Does it vary a little bit or does it vary a lot? And then if I know what the actual, if I have some calibrated test instrument and I can measure my signal and compare it to uh, whatever the tool I was using that wasn't say a test bench instrument, how close was it? How accurate was it? Is my, is my, my, my the tool I'm using, uh, not very accurate, but precise, or not very precise, but accurate, because I get different readings, but they're kind of spaced around the actual answer. Or is it kind of off both, you know, I get different readings and they're not very close. Or is it, you know, more like the test bench instrument? And, and it's interesting, you will find that you, that as you, as you, as you try and improve precision and, in dry, and, and accuracy, uh, precision is easier to deal with in the digital world we can just arbitrarily work on precision. Accuracy, there are other problems with accuracy because there's noise in the environment. And that's where the accuracy can be problematic. Uh, but there are things we can do to work around that. But anyway, uh, we, really wanna, we really wanna keep in mind whenever we give a reading. So for instance, if you measure a, the length of a board and you write that down as 10 feet 0 0.001 inch, that implies you're able to measure that board to a thousandth of an inch which may be true and may not be true. So if it's not true, you don't want to write that because that's what you're saying as an engineer. Now we'll let the non-engineers put on whatever they want and we'll understand that they may not be, uh, they may not know what they're doing. <laughs> All right, here we have an analog thermometer. Here we have a digital thermometer. Now, if you look at this, that's zero, that's 10. So you only have a mark every two degrees. So can you read this to a 10th of a degree? No way. You can't even read it. You're doing good to read it to plus or minus one degree. Maybe, maybe you could, I don't know, maybe plus or minus 0.5, I don't know, but that would be tough. Uh, it's really hard to be sure where it is in between these and, and nine is in between these marks. Um, sorry, this is, I guess one's, one's centigrade. But anyway, uh, so the Fahrenheit side, no, that's 10. Yeah, so it's 246810, 246820. Okay, here you see your digital thermometer. 
it says 37.0. So it's making the claim, that's centigrade, I guess, but this is making the claim that this is reading to a tenth of a degree. Now that, that that's the precision you can read with. That may not be that accurate. So to be that to test the accuracy, you have to compare it to a really good standard and see. But but you you can read this uh, if this is what the temperature was, and you take it again and you get the same thing, then then your precision is very good. If you take the same temperature again and and, and now the reading is thirty seven point two, well then then it your precision is a little varied, but still it's going to be pretty significantly different than the precision you can get on this. It's going to be a lot better. All right. Um, so the advantages of digital. Well, nowadays, you know, when, when, when we first started making digital devices, they were super expensive. Uh, and analog devices were cheaper. And now it's now digital devices are much cheaper. And analog can't really compete at all. We only use analog where we have to now. Uh, digital, uh, same in the old days, digital was somewhat speed limited. Analog was could be faster, but now that's not true. Now our digital is as fast as you can go. Um, and size, same thing. It's We've now shrunk stuff to the point where digital is so much smaller than any kind of analog device. Uh, although we're using nano machines for some of our analog sensors now, and they're quite small. So I guess you can say size is kind of a wash. Um, so the nice thing about digital, we usually involve some programmable elements and we can reprogram them. So we can usually change uh, we can usually change our, our digital devices fairly easily by re rewriting code. We may have to do some hardware changes if, if we're gonna use them for something radically different, but typically our digital devices, uh, many of them are, we are able to send out upgrades and apply the upgrades in the field remotely uh, with downloading firmware. So it's just incredible uh, how flexible our digital devices are now. Often we can upgrade them without even touching them. Reliable? Well, digital devices do break, um, just like analog stuff, but uh, we can make them pretty reliable because uh, for things like, uh, for stuff we put up in satellites, we build in redundancy. So we may have, we may have three copies of everything. And, and then we have circuitry to looking at the three copies and seeing if at least two of them agree. And if the two agree, then we ignore the third one. Uh, and, and if one of them breaks, then we'll be able to ignore it and stick with the ones that are working. Uh, if two of them break, then if we can figure out which two are broken, that's great. If we can't, we might have a problem then. But you can build reliable, reliability into a digital system. And, and that's true for most, most things that fly and go into space have a lot of built-in redundancy. Um, I know I, I worked on the, uh, the, the X-30, which was a horizontal takeoff to orbit plane. We didn't build it, but we got pretty far in the design process before the program was canceled. And um, some, of the, some of the manufacturers, there were three, uh, we had three uh, airframe manufacturers and two engine manufacturers competing for it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, what, some of them, one of them was using uh, quad technology and, and then some of them were using uh, tri technology. So some of them actually had quad redundancy in, in critical systems. Um, but with quad redundancy, then the problem is if two, if, 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 uh, if none of them agree, what do you, what do you trust? If two of them agree, then you can go with that one. If three agree, you can go with that one, but it's, but, but you can have, if two of them both disagree and the other two disagree, then you're, you have four results and you don't know what to do. So that can be problematic. Um, so in digital, mathematical operations can have uh, precision limited only by the cost of hardware. So back in the day when we used analog computing devices, starting with slide rules and then, um, and then actual um, uh, operational amplifier based uh, analog computers, uh, we had some real limits. By the time you multiplied A times B and then that result times C and then that result times D and that result times E, 
but you were down to maybe two or three digits of significance maximum total not i don't mean point zero zero one i mean three digits total uh and uh and but in the digital world uh cost can be a limitation but we can basically keep adding bits uh so that we we don't lose precision even after many 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 uh calculations and that's one of the real strengths of of math in the digital world um this comes into play in your bank account when you do lots and lots of transactions and compound interest daily and they're dealing in fractions of a penny uh how does that work well they can they can track fractions of a penny out to you know a millionth of a penny if they want and and uh and then keep track of all that and make sure it's included so that uh so it doesn't you know get lost from your account there there was a a guy who wrote bank software who would take uh all the rounded off uh cents and put them in a special account his <laughs> And after millions of transactions, he had a lot of money in that account. But of course, that was totally illegal because it was really somebody else's money. He just truncated off the uh, the the hundreds of a cent or the thousands of a cent. Uh, so it, these are important considerations uh, in things like banking. Um, in a digital system, generally, it's a fair statement to say that that the outputs are deterministically related to the inputs to the inputs if you know what the inputs are and where what state your system's in you you should know exactly what the output should be because that's how it's designed and it's deterministic now you can say well that's not how my computer works sometimes i try the same thing twice and get different results yeah that's true and that's because there are bugs in it <laughs> uh, there's bugs in in the Microsoft operating system, bugs in the Apple operating system, the iOSs, and occasionally things screw up. Uh, if there were no bugs, it would be true, but but uh, there are mistakes in the operating system, and sometimes conditions pop up that cause uh, behavior we didn't expect. But but in a simple system, this is true. Unless the system breaks, it's very predictable what the outputs will be given the inputs. And also in a digital system, we can control noise. Uh, <clears throat> the only place we can't control noise is on the analog front end. We call that the AFE. And many digital systems have an analog front end where we actually measure something. Like we want to measure, uh, we want to measure the temperature, say, of, of a device. Well, we we may have a we we'll, we'll have a an analog temperature sensor. That we immediately convert into digital, but but between the reading and the conversion to digital, there's there's noise that creeps in, and so that once that once it's put in digital, now we can keep it from having any more noise injected, but up until that point, noise can still be a problem. If we have an actual digital sensor, then that's different. Then we can get rid of noise completely. Um, in some systems, we we still have problems with noise because we're we didn't spend enough money on the system to get rid of it. But if we really want to get rid of it, we can. We can just make the system more complex. We can add bits. We can add redundancy. We can add error correction. Um, all right, these things are pretty much no longer true. It used to be cheaper. It used to be faster. It's not anymore. Uh, about the only place you'll see a, a, an analog system really, and not even there anymore, I guess, is really high power and really high voltage. Uh, sometimes there, we still have to have some analog uh, devices to make that work. But uh, <clears throat> transducers are still mostly analog, but uh, with, uh, with MEMS technology, they're getting smaller and smaller, and the conversion to digital is, is right at the sensor. So as soon as we measure it, we immediately convert it into a digital signal. And from then on, we can protect it and, and keep it from any more noise corruption. Um, the one thing an analog display might show us that a digital display, unless it's well designed, might not, and that is we can watch a needle on an analog instrument move, and we can we get a pretty good idea of the of the of the first and second uh, derivatives by watching the speed and how the needle's moving. Uh, whereas in a in a, a digital display, 
when the digits are changing rapidly, it, it's an unreadable display. You really can't tell what's going on. So a lot of times they will throw in an analog bar or a, like a, 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 a simulated analog display in a digital display, just so you can get a sense of the, the, the first derivative. Um, so you can, so there are workarounds, but occasionally an analog display might actually be more useful. Okay. Um, so in the analog world, you're just always saddled with noise you can't control very well. And of course, if you need to change the system and, and upgrade it, there's no such thing as uh, pushing out a field upgrade over the internet, can't do that. Uh, and there are hard limits on accuracy and precision uh, beyond the sensor, if it's an analog, a real analog system. So all the historical advantages are pretty well gone for analog. And really now we just deal with it where we have to in, a sen in the sensor world, because most real world signals are actually uh, analog signals. Um, yeah, we won't talk about analog computers. They're kind of totally passe and have been. Even, even when I was a student and, and I started at Purdue in 1965, and uh, there were some analog computers still hanging around, but nobody used them because we had, we had, we had real computers. So they were just immediately made obsolete by a, by a, by even a simple computer. All right. So again, the digital system world, we talk at about system level stuff where we break it into subsystems. And then within a subsystem, we'll have, uh, we'll have a logic block where we have inputs, a network that does something with the inputs and an output. And, and so usually there are a number of these blocks that make up a subsystem and a number of subsystems that make up a, a, the full system. So we're kind of, this course is kind of focused at this, at this low system level, if you will. And then within a circuit, there are a lot of different ways to, to make the same circuit. A dedicated integrated circuit, a programmable logic device, a microprocessor. Uh, and, the, and even if we did a, a dedicated circuit out of, uh, you know, out of gates, uh, there's a lot of different gate types we could use for the exact same circuit. And you'll see that. So here's our typical switching network. We have some inputs. We, we normally refer to those as X's, X1, X2, X3. We have some outputs, Z1, Z2. And in here is a switching network. This is our classic uh, digital design. Some inputs, maybe just one. In some cases, no inputs. And a few, a few cases, no outputs, but that's really kind of a meaningless system. There's, a, there's usually some kind of output, but we'll, we'll do some simple systems when we get to the third part of the course where we, where we don't have any defined outputs. We have flip-flop states that are outputs and we could hook LEDs to them to see what, whether they're a zero or one state, but we don't have an actual output. And in here is our switching network. When we get to the second part of the course, our switching network is going to be combinational. And the last part, it's going to be a sequential design. Uh, the sequential design means that we have some history that we remember in here. Combinational design means no history. Whatever the inputs are, we wait a little bit of time for the switching network to, to settle and boom, the outputs are good. And that's, and they're completely defined by the inputs and they should be completely predictable. Unless if they're not, the system's broken especially for simple systems. Um, all right. So again, I mentioned combinational design and sequential design. In the combinational design, back to this model, the outputs only depend on the current inputs, no history of prior inputs. In a sequential circuit, the outputs depend on the current inputs plus some history of prior inputs. It could be a little bit of history of prior inputs. It could be a very long, very complicated history of prior inputs. And we, we encode those histories by states. So every state represents some historical uh, picture of previous inputs. All right, so that's, that's sequential design. Sequential designs are more complex and much more powerful. And that's what most digital devices are made up of sequential, uh, sequential circuits. All right. So the way we do a, a switching network, we typically, uh, for a combinational design, we typically, well, we do it for sequential design too. We just use different terms. 
for a combinational design, we have what's called a truth table. So we have a table of outputs desired for various inputs. For sequential design, we have a state table. And that, that, is, that is the outputs we want for a particular state and a particular set of inputs. Um, and the state, of course, represents some sort of history. And you'll, you'll see this when we get there. We, we usually talk, start with this table, and then we simplify it using some tools or maybe just switching algebra. And then, uh, and then we can implement it with hardware. Our switching algebra expressions are directly realizable in hardware. Every, every logic expression we write in this course can immediately be, we can immediately draw a simple schematic to represent what that would be. Uh, <clears throat> in the combinational world, we'll just, that schematic would just be gates. In the, uh, in the sequential world, it would include some memory elements like flip-flops, although flip-flops are made up of just gates. So, uh, so again, in the sequential world, we have states in our system. There's no theoretical limit to the number of states, but obviously there is some practical limit. Uh, almost all of our devices are two-state devices where where they can hold zeros or ones, uh, high volt, you know, uh, say five volts in ground or 3.3 volts in ground or whatever. But there are some things where we're now using tri-state and quad state, uh, where it can hold, uh, you know, se several different uh, levels representing three or four different values. And you'll see this in the flash memory used in jump drives is, is now three and four state. Um, we do have some uh, three state uh, uh, buffers, and we'll talk about those down the road. But really, the third state in those buffers is just a disconnected state. So it's either a one or a zero, or it's, or it's, it's not outputting anything. Uh, and that's important because when we connect a bunch of outputs together to create a bus, we need to be able to disconnect the things from the bus that aren't supposed to be transmitting. So only one device is sending a signal over the bus. Because if the device sends a zero, but something else sends a one, that's basically a short circuit. If the zero represents ground and the one is represented by say five volts, then now you've got five volts connected to ground and something's gonna get hot and, and blow. Um, all right, so all of our design tools really are for two state devices. And this is part of one of the principles, uh, we looked at the discipline principle where we restrain ourselves to just using two state devices. Now we, we violate that in some things. And my guess is as time goes on, we'll see more and more um, exceptions to the, to the two state rule. Uh, so one of these days we may be dealing with uh, base three world numbers instead of base two. So instead of binary numbers, we'll be using trinary numbers. That's gonna be a big change because everything in the digital world now is strictly set up on the binary system. All right, there are some physical devices that are sequential devices and some that are combinational. Multiplexers, diodes, transistors, ICs, essentially, these are physical devices. And, and from these devices, all the outputs are defined as either ones or zeros, two different voltage levels. Ground and five volts, ground and 3.3, ground and 1.8 volts, whatever, whatever system we're running the voltage at, whatever running the system voltage at, that would be a one and then ground would be zero. And the reason binary numbers were so useful is that they're base two. So every binary number, uh, every digit in the binary number represents a zero or a one. And we typically call that one bit. And then if we have two bits, then we, have, we can have zero, zero, we can have zero, one, we can have one, zero and one, one. So two bits gives us four different values. And so if n is the number of bits, we can represent two to the n different things with n bits. All right. <clears throat> so we also have um, something we call, let's see, let me check this real quick. So there we are. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we also have um, this thing called hardware description language. Because we can no longer 
layout schematics for devices that we have because the schematics are so huge. We we have we all digital devices now are designed using hardware description language. Uh, and our hardware description language uh, basically allows us to write Engl English language statements that look like a computer program, but will actually manufacture, uh, create all the all the photo masks we need and all the steps to, to manufacture an integrated circuit that does what our hardware description language wants it to do, or a bit file that we can program into a programmable logic device to make it do what we want it to do. So it's very much like a computer program for hardware. Now we also have computers that are programmable and the computer and many of our microcomputers have so many onboard uh, functional modules that we can write a, a C language program and make them do just about anything as well. So almost all of our design work is now done with these English language based tools that are essentially like computer languages like C, uh, Verilog and VHDL are the two main HDLs, although there's some there's some new ones coming out, System Verilog, System C, some other stuff. But um, but uh, these hardware description languages are there are there are no there well there are no integrated circuits. Um, maybe I won't say it quite like that. There there's certainly some some specialized and analog integrated circuits that are not. Uh, strictly just uh, Verilog, but most all integrated circuits are designed using Verilog. All right. And in this course, we are going to do an introduction to these hardware description languages. In, in, in this course, using my book, we're going to do Verilog because that's what we use in the department. Uh, and that's what is used to make most of the integrated circuits in the United States. Uh, VHDL is a little more used in Europe uh, and somewhat here for our simulation and the, and you will see VHDL, but uh, they're they're similar but they're enough different that it's confusing. So we're just going to focus on Verilog, and we'll we won't talk about VHDL much. All right. So Moore's law. How many of you have heard of Moore's law? Does anybody know what Moore's law is? It's how engineers who go through time and continuously make equipment better each year or faster or smarter. Yeah, that's that's kind of a paraphrase of it. What what it actually the official Moore's law was that that every 12 to 18 months the number of transistors we can fit on an integrated circuit doubles. And that's been that's been true for a long time now, but we are getting to the point where there are a lot of people that are worried that Moore's law may be coming to an end. Uh, currently, our our current fabrication technologies are pushing down to ten nanometer feature size stuff. Uh, Twenty eight nanometer has kind of become standard. Um, there's been a big rivalry between Intel and AMD. AMD outsources all of their fabrication to a to to the integrated integrated circuits lab in in uh, in Taiwan. Intel has their own lab, and the IC lab in Taiwan has been able to master the ten nanometer technology, and the Intel lab was having lots of yield problems and problems getting ten nanometer to, to be really uh, working well, and that has caused the price of Intel stock to drop like a rock and the price of AMD stock to skyrocket. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting world. Uh, of course, Taiwan could get invaded by China and screw all that up in a heartbeat. So who knows how this is all gonna play out. But, um, but up till now they've been able, they really have, maybe it's more like every two years. Uh, it's, in the early days, it was every year to every year and a half, but now, now it takes about two years to double. And I, I, I think we are with 10 nanometers, we may be at a, we may see this curve stall out a little bit. I don't know. It's going to be going to be interesting. Uh, the problem is that um, that at 10 nanometer feature size, that's 30 silicon atoms across a feature. 
So now we're, we're down to countable atoms across a feature in an integrated circuit. And we're doing this, we're doing this with light exposure. But even if we use even fancier exposures than we're doing now to get features smaller, at some point we run out of silicon atoms. So if we did five nanometer, you know, then that's 15 silicon atoms. If you get down to one nanometer, you know, that's three silicon atoms on a feature. That may not be enough to make the feature work. Uh, so, uh, and if we, and, and okay, even there, so if you go down, now you've got one and a half atoms, so there's no such thing as half an atom. So you've got either one or two atoms. Then you get down to one atom. There's no such thing as half an atom. So you can't go smaller than one atom per feature. And we're knocking on that door. Uh, so, so there's a reckoning coming in Moore's law. And I, 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 I'm not smart enough to predict how that's gonna play out. Obviously we're looking for, uh, we're looking for a new, new ways to make integrated circuits. But, uh, but, you know, I don't know, I don't know what we're gonna use because there's nothing s s much smaller than atoms. So uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's going to have to be some really crazy quantum thing. And that's where quantum computing comes in. But that's, that's not an integrated circuit per se. So we may, maybe we'll be using some really amazing quantum effects. Um, I don't know. But we're, we're, we're getting close to the molecular level. Um, all right. So, um, all right. Uh, so when we have when we have schematic square miles in size, we can't really use them. That's kind of a typo there. So I'll fix that in a minute. Our our basically our design process has become pretty automated. I mean, obviously there's a the the initial design stage where we describe the device we want to make. That's that's got it still done. Uh, that still has to have human input, obviously. But once you get past that. Uh, the rest of it's pretty computer based, all automated. So last night uh, I had 10 students over and we worked till 930 and then I, I was up till midnight fixing the boards that uh, had a few problems. Um, we didn't make quite 100 boards, but I think we only have about 61 boards made. We need another 30 to have 90 for the class. So we're going to have to do it again on Sunday. And uh, but uh, I have a pick and place machine and a, and a stencil and a re and we had a couple of reflow ovens and we, uh, we stenciled the boards with solder paste. We pick and place the surface mount parts on them. And then we popped them in the reflow oven and baked them and soldered all the parts down. And the students will get that board and then a, a handful of parts that are through hole parts, plastic that you can't reflow and they'll solder those on by hand. And we'll use that board for 10 labs in micro one. And that's what you guys will do next fall or next spring, whenever you take micro one. So this involves a, a stencil, which is a piece, thin piece of stainless steel with laser cut holes in it that you can place over the printed circuit board and squeegee solder paste over it. And then a pick and place machine that pulls parts off of tape and reel and puts them in the right place on these boards with very high degree, uh, 0.1 uh, millimeters precision, basically. And then we put them in a reflow oven and the, and the solder paste turns in, uh, the solder balls and the solder paste melt and the flux in the solder paste cleans the metal and you get, a, you get the part is uh, soldered on. And it's very accurate. The pitch on those parts are quite small. The, uh, it looks like the actual, uh, the actual board look like this. This is, the actual, this is the actual board that we made. We made 61 of these last night. And there are two chips on there, uh, one up here and one down there. That's a that's a pick chip down there, and that's that's the chip that powers the uh, that's an Atmel 328 PB, uh, which is slightly upgraded from the uh, the the Arduino Uno uh, board. It had a AT, AT Mega 328P. The B's got some extra features. Anyway, that's what we did. And I'm still feeling the effects. <laughs> All right. 
Um, so let's see. So so the push to making everything digital is uh, it's, they're more powerful, less cost, less noise, more flexible, smaller, use less energy, and uh, and just the list goes on and on. Field upgradable, flexible, easy easy to uh, make small changes. Uh, uh, we can mass produce them uh, very inexpensively. And but the real world's analog. Most sensors are analog, although the MEM stuff is changing that a little bit. Uh, but then the question is, well, is the real world really analog? Uh, our brain is actually fully digital. It uses uh, chemical levels for the ones and zeros, and it actually uses uh, it doesn't it's not constrained to binary system, uh, but the neuron either fires or it doesn't. Uh, when you when you when you make a muscle movement, the the muscles that are actually making that movement are either completely the individual fibers, the the the, the actual we call it the there's a motor end plate and there's a group of fibers that constitute that motor group, but there's thousands and thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of motor groups in a given muscle, but but any one motor group is either fired or it's relaxed, completely fired, completely relaxed, no in between for a muscle group. But you can have fine motions, like I can play the viola with you know very delicate control pressure and precision placement and whatnot, because I'm at any given moment, I'm firing some group of muscles, some group of, of, uh, of uh, motor end plates, and then, but a bunch of the other motor end plates are not firing, so I can I can adjust the pressure of the muscle very very precisely, even though all the individual motor groups are either completely fired or completely relaxed. But we achieve it by having lots and lots of them, and that's the same thing. This 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 is how, the same way we do it in digital. Uh, so our thoughts in our brains, um, it, they're stored in 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 a in a big sensation uh, that's basically uh, there's a value. It's not a binary value, but every every neuron uh, has sort of a weighted value. And when you sum those up, you either get an output or you don't. And that's that kind of contributes to your thought. Um, when you get down to the to the uh, to the cell, to the atomic level, you're dealing with protons. Oh, neutrons and electrons, and then they're broken into subatomic particles. So, but you get down to the point where there's nothing below that as far as we know. So at that level, uh, we, we deal with quantum mechanics. Well, why do we call it quantum mechanics? Well, we call it quantum mechanics because the, the, the physical properties at the quantum level can only assume certain values. They're quantized just like notes in music. Uh, electrons can only be in, in a, there's a list of, of orbits they can occupy and they can only be in one of those orbits. They cannot be in between. They are never in between because the solution to our describing equations doesn't exist between the orbits. In fact, when you take, quant when you take um, uh, differential equations in PDEs, you'll see that these equations only have solutions. Mo many of those equations only have solutions at 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 at, at fractional values of pi. You know, pi over two, three pi over two, uh, pi over four, six pi over four. Well, seven pi over four, whatever it is. They only have solutions at discrete values. So, so just then is in the digital world, we force signals into quant into these bins. In the actual physical world we live in, uh, the energy levels of all the particles that make up our body are forced into bins. They only can occupy certain bins. They cannot be in between bins. Um, all right. I want to say a couple more words and I'm going to quit. I know I'm a little over time here. Algorithms. Algorithms can be serial or parallel. When you write a computer program, step one, step two, step three, that is a serial algorithm. When you uh, develop a neural net, especially if you implement the nodes in hardware, that's, that's a parallel algorithm. You put in, you put in uh, 
all the signals to the to the input layer and boom the output layer generates a bunch of signals out and that all happens in parallel so if all our algorithms could be placed in in strictly a parallel algorithm we could have almost unlimited speed in our algorithms because we can always add additional hardware in a, to uh, crunch a parallel algorithm a little faster or at least up to some limits anyway but a serial algorithm is that's problematic we can only push our processors so fast so that's why there's very little there's very little left to be squeezed out of processors what's what's out there to be gotten is to change our serial algorithms into parallel that's why you see you know you add cores well that's great if you can add cores and you can divide your algorithm into more into more parallel steps that can be done at the same time that works but what if you have to complete all of step one before you can do step two because you need the results of step one to do step two now now you can't have it in parallel form you have to you have to do step one and then step two and and this whole world of tr trying to think and change our algorithms into these uh these parallel algorithms it is is really an area of great uh, exploration and development um now the whole push and, and allure of quantum computing is that it that it can it can pursue uh, an infinite number of uh, of of possible outcomes simultaneously uh but the problem with that is as soon as you interrogate your quantum computer it condenses to a single solution and how do you make that solution it condenses to to be the one you're actually interested in that's the trick the other trick is scaling right now we can't scale it uh, we can do 100 qubits but we can't scale it to uh to several thousand qubits all right so that's it any any questions about that and, and then we'll uh we'll pick up again on monday i just had a, a clarifying question sure. um most classes that are an hour are usually really only 50 minutes. Is that the case with this course or? Well, I, I, since we're online, I'm kind of cheating. But in person, I'll, you know, I won't cheat. Gotcha. So you guys are all kicked back in your, you know, in your office, your bedroom. So anyway, yeah, I went over today. I'm, I, I usually won't do that. I'll try and keep it to 50 minutes. Oh yeah, no problem. I was just making sure. Yeah, we might go over a minute or two, but yeah, usually if you go over too long, some professor's coming in and gets ticked off at you. The engineering professors are usually pretty flexible, but if it's a if it's a government professor, they may they may not like engineers, so they may want to stand around and pout. All right, any other questions? Um, excuse me, Professor. Could I get a quick clarification on the parallel algor algorithms? Sure. Ask um, what? So essentially, all it does is the difference between a serial algorithm is it can do multiple steps at the same time. So instead of going to one, to two, to three, it does all one, two, and three at the same time. Yeah. But so, but, but what do you do when two needs the answer from one and three needs the answer from two? You see, well, then you're not allowed to use a parallel algorithm at that point. Yeah, then it's problematic. Yes. And and when we when our computers uh, are pipelined, which all of them, almost all our computer chips now are pipelined, even the even our micro, even our simple 8 bit microprocessor chips are pi pipelined. So they're working on two instructions at the same time. Uh, but in, in the Intel and AMD big chips and in some of the Apple chips and it, all this is going to kind of change. I don't know. I think there's going to be a big revolution think the, the, the we've been using this ia32 uh approach with the amd and intel chips for years but it's it's not a it's it's really dated it's really dated and uh so i think we're going to see uh arm processors come in and, and start running everything uh so it's going to be interesting but anyway uh, in our big pipeline systems and all, all of them are pipeline now what do you what do you think the pipeline does when it has say 15 instructions in the pipeline all in partial stages of execution how does this work well it has to like slow down and do one before the other and kind of kind of like does like a backup it it has to freeze the pipeline 
if there's a dependency that's not resolvable. That's right. And that happens all the time. So we have all this capability that could be whaling, but mostly it's ham hamstrung. So the idea is you should write code in such a way that, that you anticipate that it's going to be executed with a pipelined core. And, and you should really try hard as much as you can to uh, to you know to limit the times where there are obvious dependencies that are going to going to going to slow things down. That's easier. That's easy to say. It's a little harder to visualize and implement. But all right. Any other questions? All righty. We will see you guys on Monday. Have a good weekend. Stay warm.